I am an outcast, against the grain of society. What is an outcast? A person who has been rejected or ostracised by their society or social group. Perhaps that's too strong a word to describe myself. Perhaps I'm a maverick, an unorthodox or independent-minded person. Either way, for a long time, I know I haven't fit well into society. Humans are a social animal. 80% or more of humans usually go along with the crowd. This is due to normative influence. People often conform from a desire for security within a group, which leads to people exhibiting public compliance, but not necessarily private acceptance, of the group's social norms in order to be accepted by the group. The other 20% or less hesitate or even refuse to conform. They accept that the majority of people will disagree with them and may even treat them badly because of it. Sometimes the 20% call the 80% sheep, but I would say that the 80% are simply people. They're behaving exactly as expected. Just as buffalo and caribou stick together in their herd, so do people. Historically, it's been the best way to stay alive. I don't blame people for doing this, I totally get it, for, but for whatever reason, I just don't go along. Solomon Ash Conformity Experiment, 1951. In this experiment, one real person was placed in a group of five stooges who were there simply to give incorrect answers. The participant, of course, didn't know this and thought that everybody there was real. Each person in the room had to state aloud which comparison line, A, B or C, was most like the target line. The answer was always obvious. The real participant sat at the end of the row and gave their answer last. About 75% of participants conformed at least once, with 30%, sorry, 37% always going along with the majority. This means they went along with an obviously incorrect answer. In the control group, where there was no pressure to conform, less than 1% of participants gave the wrong answer. Apparently, people conform for two main reasons, because they want to fit in with the group, normative influence, or because they believe the group is better informed than they are, informational influence. Of course, this study was done back in 1951, so there have been a number of other studies done since then, but certainly this experiment by Ash is a great starting point to see how humans conform under certain conditions. Anyway, in this presentation I'll give you some examples from my life where I didn't conform, and consequently was treated as somewhat of an outcast. Church. I was raised a Lutheran and attended church most Sundays with my family. When I was younger, I didn't mind it so much, but once I was about age 12, I started having catechism classes in order to become a confirmed Lutheran, with confirmation occurring at age 14. Throughout these classes, the pastor taught us all about Lutheranism. One thing he taught that I remember quite vividly is the doctrine of sacramental union during Holy Communion, in which the body and blood of Christ are truly and substantially present, offered and received with the bread and wine. I don't know, but that sounded a bit far-fetched to me, so I started questioning the pastor. He didn't take too kindly to me questioning it, and accused me of not having enough faith. If only I had the proper amount of faith, then I would make a good Christian. Anyway, I managed to keep my mouth shut over the next year or two, and was confirmed at age 14. But one day, while I was up receiving communion, my friend had just had a dental procedure the previous day. While he was drinking the wine, remember, the actual blood of Christ, some blood started dripping down from his mouth onto the carpet. I immediately started giggling, as did he. The pastor gave us a stern look. After church, it was customary to line up and shake hands with the pastor as we exited the church. When it came to my turn, the pastor grabbed me by the hand and told me that I had upset God by laughing at Christ's blood being dropped on the floor. I tried to explain that my friend had a numb mouth from the previous day's dental work and that it was just a mistake. Anyway, from that day onwards, the pastor didn't particularly act very well towards me, and consequently, it didn't take me too long to decide that I no longer wished to attend church, and I pretty much abandoned Lutheranism altogether. I was an outcast. 
A couple of years later, after my parents had divorced, the pastor came over to my dad's house to visit me. I was the only one home at the time. We had a good chat and catch up. He made a point of telling me that the congregation really missed my family and would very much like to see us back at church. I told him that we'd definitely think about it, but I never went back. I ended up moving to Japan instead. High School Maths C Seating Arrangements – The Unwritten Rule When I first started studying at high school, I very quickly realised that wherever you start sitting in a class at the start of the semester is pretty much where you'll stay throughout the entire semester. So I was studying Maths C – I think it's called Specialist Mathematics now – only nine people in the school were studying it. One of my classmates was a very athletic rugby player named Jason, and was not only physically fit, but also quite smart. The girls liked him. The boys liked him. I hated him. I don't know why, I just didn't like him. Anyway, one day, a thought popped into my head. Why do I have to keep sitting in the same old seat day in, day out? So on the spur of the moment, I just decided to sit at Jason's desk. I knew he wouldn't like it. I knew I was only a skinny maths nerd, but then I thought, what's he going to do? I looked around and could see the look on the other classmates' faces. They knew there was going to be trouble. Anyway, Jason walked in, stood in front of his desk, staring at me. I asked him what was wrong. I could see him contemplating whether he was going to manhandle me or not, but he just quietly walked past and sat at another desk. To be fair to him, he handled it very well. Although he did keep staring at me throughout the entire class, formulating a plan what he was going to do with me outside the classroom. In the end, he never touched me, but he did go and tell all of his friends what happened. He had a lot of friends, all of which started treating me quite badly whenever they saw me. During the next Math C class, I decided to move back to my original desk, but the teacher actually did make a point of saying that there is no rule about sitting seating arrangements and that we were free to sit wherever we wanted to. But of course, that didn't sway the opinion of Jason. For the next year or so, I was pretty much treated like an outcast by the entire rugby team. Thinking back, it was kind of stupid of me. If I just wanted to make a point of sitting at a different desk, then I could have sat at any other desk in the classroom that didn't already have a person sitting at it. But instead, I chose to sit at the popular rugby player's desk knowing that I was probably going to start a war. I honestly don't know why I did it. Maybe I thought it would be more meaningful and memorable, but in the end, it was just a stupid decision and another example of me going against the societal grain for little gain. Martin Bryant, a convicted Australian mass shooter who killed 35 people in 1996. Many of my classmates were deeply affected by this news, and so our teachers decided to have an open conversation with us in class about it. We went around the room saying what we thought about Martin Bryant. Some students said, he's a psycho. Others said, they should lock him away and throw away the key. Eye for an eye. They should shoot him. When it came to my turn, I simply asked, why did he do it? Was he bullied? Was he abused at home? Anyway, my teacher didn't take too kindly to my line of questioning and accused me of trying to justify what Bryant did. My classmates turned on me as well, calling me weirdo or psycho or whatever else they said. Basically, how dare I try to figure out why he did it? I should have either just shut up or gone along with the crowd and called Bryant a sociopath. Clearly, I misread the crowd. I thought we were there to have an open discussion, but as it turned out, the teacher just wanted us to yell abuse at Bryant. Coming third on purpose. I was a pretty good medium distance runner. One year, I came second in the 1500 metres and therefore was eligible to go to the regionals. However, that required me to get up early three days a week and go train with my other teammates. I hated it. The day of the big regional race came around and I knew that the top eight would go through to the state finals, so I tried my best not to run too fast. As I was rounding the final corner, I realised that I was probably in the top eight so I intentionally slowed down and walked the last 10 metres or so. A number of boys passed me and I ended up coming 10th. People from my school came up to me yelling, What are you doing? Why did you slow down? I just lied and said, I thought I already crossed the finish line. 
From that point onwards, many of my teammates suspected me. They had a feeling that in many of my races, I was coming third on purpose, just to avoid going through to the finals or whatever. Actually, they were right. I just didn't want to be in the limelight. I didn't want to go to training. I didn't want to have all that pressure on me. In the end, I chose to be outcast instead. Japan Conformity is common in Japan. However, a socially withdrawn subgroup, the so-called hikikomori, appears to be unable to conform, yet is also unwilling to rebel. It's basically a form of severe social withdrawal which is characterized by adolescents and young adults who become recluses in their parents' homes, unable to work or go to school for months or even years at a time. Yanki are another subculture that refuse to conform with traditional Japanese society, and instead embrace punkish rebellion. They join motorcycle gangs, so-called speed tribes, dye their hair blonde or red, with Yanki women wearing modified school uniforms or miniskirts and platforms. They often squat as if they are going to the toilet, so-called unko suari, or poo sitting. Understandably, Yankees don't have very good prospects in conformist Japan and usually have to make do with casual jobs at convenience stores and the like. I had my own run-ins with Japanese conformity when I was working over there as an English teacher. Occasionally, we would have a free period or two due to cancellations or lack of bookings or whatever else, and our manager, a young Japanese lady, would come out and ask us to do mundane tasks such as cleaning the floors or windows, or tidying up the lunch tables and chairs. Every time she asked me, I would refuse. I told her I'm happy to prepare lesson plans or whatever, as long as it's related to teaching English, but I refused to do any menial labour. In hindsight, I was probably a bit mean, but to be fair, I was only in my early 20s and I didn't like the idea of going over to Japan to wash windows and vacuum the floors. Anyway, after about the 20th time her asking me to vacuum the floors, I started to wonder why she kept asking me. Obviously, I wasn't going to do it, but then I started to think that perhaps she liked me, so I asked her out to lunch, and she said yes. That evening, she came over to my apartment to help me prepare lesson plans, and that's exactly what she went on to tell her co-workers that we did when they inevitably found out she was coming over to my place in the evenings. She literally told them that she was helping me prepare lesson plans. Whenever my co-workers asked me why she was coming over to my place, I would jokingly tell them that she was helping me prepare lesson plans as well. My Australian friend from another school also had a similar experience. He started seeing one of his Japanese teachers, a huge no-no in Japan. She could have lost her job. But it just happened that she was also the district karate champion for her weight division. She was a third degree black belt, so whenever anybody asked why she was visiting my friend's apartment, she always answered, practicing karate. So it became a bit of a running joke between us. What did you do on the weekend? Practiced karate. How about yourself? Prepared some lesson plans. And we had to do it this way, otherwise our female companions would have lost their jobs. As it was left unspoken, nothing bad happened. In the end, even though my manager liked my initial rebellious streak, ultimately she needed someone who was willing to conform to the Japanese way of life, otherwise it was just not going to work. So we ended up having to end our little rendezvous. China Conformity is extremely common in China as well. I worked as an English teacher at a small kindergarten, and every morning we had to stand and sing the Chinese national anthem while the flag was being raised. Despite protests from the principal, I told her I'm happy to stand up and participate in the ceremony every morning, but I'm not going to salute as China is not my country and I shouldn't swear allegiance to it. She seemed to understand, but also told me that if I was Chinese, I would lose my job. I suppose that was a veiled threat, but it didn't work on me. It kind of reminds me of that German photograph of one man, August Landmesser, who refused to perform the Nazi salute with the other workers. Consequently, for my refusal to salute the flag, I very much got off on the wrong foot with the principal. Beijing summers got very hot, so often I would wear shorts to work. Just as often, the principal would tell me that shorts are not appropriate work attire, and I would tell her I understand, but then the very next day, I would wear shorts again. I just can't help myself but go against the grain. 
These are photos I downloaded from the school's website with me wearing shorts, so I guess they gave up trying to tame me, but they did post these photos without my permission, which I let slide. Here are some more photos of me which I randomly discovered on some Beijing billboards scattered throughout the north part of the city. They were also posting these without my permission, but I guess because I refused to salute the flag and refused to dress how she wanted me to, the principal decided to do whatever she damn well pleased with my photos. I suppose I became a bit of a minor celebrity in the region, which I wasn't exactly thrilled about, but what could I do? Sue them? Yeah, right. I was also asked by the principal to go on voluntary day trips with the other staff, team building I suppose, but unsurprisingly I refused. I felt that I wasn't getting paid nearly enough to spend my days off at work as well. Although I liked my co-workers, they were all females which I saw every day, so sometimes I just needed some time apart. The kindergarten was providing me with free accommodation, with the understanding that I was the only one living there. But of course I broke the rules and had my girlfriend living with me, my future wife. Whenever the owners would come over for their monthly inspections, my girlfriend would move out and I would pretend that I was the only one living there. One time though, my girlfriend accidentally left her pink toothbrush in the bathroom and the owners asked me what it was. I didn't lie, I told them it was a pink toothbrush. They had their suspicions, but couldn't prove anything. China continued. Here's me going swimming in Beijing. You'd think nothing could go wrong at a Chinese swimming pool, but you would be wrong. I got into a fight with the local swimming pool attendant because, you see, I was wearing board shorts. And apparently that was a big no-no. Chinese men wear tight little shorts when they swim, and that's the rule. I stood there for about half an hour arguing with a number of pool attendants. I saw no issue in wearing board shorts. But in the end, the manager came out and said if I don't put on the little shorts, they're going to call the police and have me arrested. As it was hot and I didn't particularly want to be arrested and potentially deported, I put on the damn shorts. The funny thing about all of this was that Chinese women can wear whatever they want to. They could wear skimpy little bikinis or anything else. There's double standards everywhere. I tried to enter a local Wu Mart, but the guard came up to me and told me I couldn't enter because of my shorts. Shorts again? But I saw other men wearing shorts entering the building, so I protested his decision. After fumbling around with a phrase book for a short time, I realised he wasn't refusing me entry because of my shorts, but because my shorts were ripped. Although ripped shorts may have been considered cool in Australia at the time, they certainly weren't at Wu Mart. Here's a photo of me sitting on Chairman Mao's lap. I knew it would get me into trouble, but I did it anyway. The guards came racing up and told me to get off and said if I do it again, I'll be arrested. I didn't push my luck. Amazingly, I never got arrested in China. I think that they're probably not as strict as people make out, but then again, I haven't been over there recently. Here's me again up on the mountain in an area where I shouldn't be. This one I happen to agree with. Please don't take stupid photos like this. People do die. Soon after this photo was taken, a park ranger popped out of nowhere and told me to get down. I refused, so he pushed me off the cliff. That's a joke, people. After living and visiting China over the years, I realised conformity is seen as a virtue in China. Listen and obey is very much the motto in Chinese schools and in Chinese society in general. That's the only way they can control such a huge population. Consequently, I cannot make China my permanent home unless something drastically changes. 2021 and beyond Although I have lots of other stories where I refused to conform, here we are currently in 2021, a year where lots of people are going against the grain. Due to my own personal choices, I will be formally excluded from society in the upcoming weeks and months, again due to my resistance to conform. People sometimes hate me because of it, people sometimes question my motives, people sometimes distrust me, but ultimately, throughout my life, I simply do not like going along with the majority of people. I naturally go against the grain. I don't blame anyone, this is entirely on me. I am an outcast due to my reluctance to conform. And that's okay. I've accepted my fate. Mm -hmm.